There are plenty of popular politics newsletters out there, but none with the kind of unique origin story of Wake Up to Politics. It was started by Gabe Fleischer when he was only nine years old. While the early editions were sent out by a Gmail account and only read by his mom, Gabe kept at it, waking up early every day before school to write the newsletter. Flash forward about a decade, and he's now a senior at Georgetown University, and Wake Up Politics is close to 50,000 subscribers. In my interview with Gabe, we talked about what kept him motivated all these years, how he monetizes the newsletter, and what he plans to do with it once he graduates. Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. If you want to listen to an audio version of this show, subscribe to The Business of Content wherever you get your podcasts. And longtime listeners of this show know that it carries no advertising. The only way to support the painstaking work I do here is by becoming a paid subscriber to my newsletter. Subscribers get a half-hour introductory phone call with me. They also get to submit questions every month that I try my best to answer on this very show. Subscribe at simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with Gabe. Hey Gabe, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So you're still in college now. I think you're either a junior or senior, and you write this incredibly popular daily newsletter about politics. Um, but it was actually started when you were very, very young. When did you first start getting interested in politics? Yeah, I first really started getting interested in politics during the 2008 elections. Um, I was about six or seven years old. And, you know, for whatever reason, I think just kind of in an election cycle, politics are kind of all around us you know, debates, advertisements, yard signs, you know, that whole deal as we're kind of going through right now. And I just really got fascinated with the whole process and started asking my parents a bunch of questions, sometimes more questions than they could answer. And I um, started reading a bunch of books about politics. And that's really when I when I first got fascinated with it. And were your parents like really interested and you were seeing them watch it on the TV? Or like, how did you kind of get become aware of what politics were? Yeah, I would say, I mean, neither of my parents work in politics. I think, you know, they both vote and they're both, you know, I think they follow politics, but neither at kind of a, you know, super granular level. But certainly politics was something that was, you know, in the ether, at, you know, in my house and kind of something, I guess, you know, maybe not quite six or seven, but later, you know, something discussed at the dinner table and stuff like that. So it wasn't, neither of them work in politics or media or anything like that, but um, definitely they, they paid attention to the election. And I think that was kind of my, my route into it. So what was your kind of, cons- how did you consume political news as like a seven-year-old? Like, were you going to like the New York Times website or what, what was that like? Um, yeah, I, it's kind of hard to remember back. But yeah, I think, yeah, going, yeah, going to New York Times, other websites like that. I definitely very early on did start reading newsletters and like Mike Allen, um, then the really? Playbook. You were that seven or eight years old at reading? I don't know about seven, <laughs> I don't know about seven but early, that yeah. was definitely something. And then when I started my news, that was definitely an inspiration. I, I couldn't say exactly when, but definitely pretty early on. Playbook was, was something that I started reading um, pretty early on. I wonder if you were Playbook's youngest reader. Probably. That I don't know. I, be, I, I bet you say. you were. So <laughs> you're getting obsessed with politics. You're seeing like newsletters and stuff like that, like uh, like Playbook. When did you start getting the idea of launching your own newsletter? Yeah, so the newsletter started in 2011. I was like nine years old. Um, and I really, you know, I, I was not imagining some like, you know, big newsletter or something, anything kind of, you know, um, major, certainly anything that would turn into like a job or anything like that. It was really just, I love politics. I, I really love to write and read and write. And I, you know, thought, hey, like, well, I could try this, you know, see what happens and, you know, try my hand at it. And so, so the newsletter in 2011 um, for one subscriber, my mom. Um, and that was the extent of the mailing list. Um, and I, I just um, started sending it out, you know, seeing what, what, what could happen with it. And um, it, it's grown a bit from there. And it, was there an inspiration for the newsletter? Was like, cause like a lot of like I, when I started, I certainly had inspirations of people that I read on the internet when I started blogging and I was trying to be like them. Was there anything like that for you? Yeah, I think if anything, although I think the style and format was even from the beginning pretty different and voice too, I think was pretty different. I would say playbook. I mean, that was certainly the newsletter that I remember reading. Um, if not at seven, certainly by the time I had started my own. Um, and that was something I was like checking, I, um, checking every morning. And so I think that was certainly some inspiration to me and just kind of the idea of this kind of, you know, daily email that would come out each morning, um, you know, and I think the idea of a newsletter was very attractive me from the very beginning of this kind of conversation between writer and reader. Um, and, and each iteration of Playbook's done that a little bit differently. Um, but, but certainly when Mike Allen did it, um, you know, I think you would see glimpses every once in a while into his personal life, which he now does in Axios as well. Um, and I think, you know, just, just that kind of like 
authentic conversation. And, and, and I also certainly looked at him as someone who just knew everything about politics, you know, was kind of covering things um, at a very, very granular level. And, and, and I aspire to do things a little bit differently and not as kind of as the inside the beltway, you know, as that. But, um, but certainly reading that was something that first kind of opened my eyes to, to something like that. I assume you've since met Mike Allen. I actually, I've, I've never met him. We've oh. like DM'd, I think, oh. and, and emailed. Um, I actually, I haven't. Well, maybe he'll be listening or watching this and he'll, he'll understand that he was the kind of catalyst. Um, so what you had was incredibly rudimentary. You didn't use an ESP. It was just like you were sending it from your like personal Gmail account. That's right. Yeah, it was, it was all from Gmail up until you know the limit of when Gmail doesn't let you send to any anyone else anymore. And so yeah, it was just you know, like I said, started with my mom, and then kind of you know friends, family, and kind of grew, and then you know people would forward it to other people and and kind of email me and ask me, and that was kind of the extent of it um, for the first few few years at least. Did you just like have like a Google Doc or a WordPress file or something where you you copy and pasted the email addresses from? I think it was literally like a file in like. Which I don't even think Gmail does this anymore, like Google Contacts. Like I think I honestly don't even think that exists anymore. But like Gmail used to have in the Gmail app, or like in if you go to gmail.com, like would have like contacts. Um, and then you could make folders in that. And it was like I had a folder that was just like wake up to politics mailing list. And I don't even think that infrastructure exists anymore. Correct me if I'm wrong. So how do you, how did it grow beyond your mom? Like how did you start adding people to it? Yeah, so I mean, I think at the very beginning, which is kind of family and friends and people, you know, I I think um, you know people that we knew and started sending it to them, and then they would send it to other people. Um, I think fairly early on, it you know, it was only got a little bit of media attention. I think just because of the novelty of like I was so young and kind of doing it, um, and I think so. I think even far far before it was like a product that probably now we're looking back and be kind of proud of, and I think it was still something that was pretty rudimentary, but it, it was still obviously something that was kind of interesting. So I think 2012, actually on Super Tuesday 2012, um, I was on the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, my hometown newspaper. Um, and that was kind of the first moment, um, I guess around a year in, that like I think it started expanding to people beyond just people that I knew or people who knew people that I knew. And it was suddenly kind of people, I think still mostly in the St. Louis area, but um, that I had no real connection to. And how did people sign up? Like they just had to email you and say, please add me to your list or something? That was in the beginning. Yeah, I, it was a few years um, until it's there There was any sort of website at all. So yeah, at first it was kind of just people emailing me. In the case of that post dispatch article, I think a lot of people emailed the author of that article who then forwarded to me like all these dozens and dozens of people who were asking to be added. And so that was how people got added from that. And then, um, but I, I, I was certainly me. And then also, yeah, I think with the guidance of my parents who at never, at no point were like involved with the newsletter, certainly in writing it or putting it together, kind of anything like that, um, you know, or anything more than readers, but certainly in terms of like being careful into how much I wanted it to be like a public thing. And so we were very careful for a long time, but you know, not really having a website, not making it that easy for people to subscribe, which is obviously not a great uh, business idea or anything like that. But obviously I was very young and, and it was not not something I was doing as a business or anything like that. Um, it was just a passion project and something I enjoyed doing. And I think um, my parents correctly and I kind of thought, you know, it w wasn't something best when I was so young to be something that, you know, kind of anyone could access. So at the very beginning, there was no website at all. And then as I got older, um, you know, I, I, I think you know, got a website and then eventually I think I think I turned 13, whatever which age you could join Twitter and I had to convince my parents and that was something I was able to do kind of, you know, those kind of milestones, I guess, as I grew older, sometimes at the ages that you, the very minimum age you could join those platforms, I guess. So as you're sending it from this Gmail account, like is some, and then once it grew to like complete strangers, were people like responding to it or what was the kind of interactions that you were seeing from people on this list? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's something that I've always, you know, a, a part of the news that I've always really loved is, you know, how interactive it is and, you know, people always responding. I, you know, um, all the time in the newsletter, you know, my, my goal with it is really um, to, 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 to be explanatory and to explain politics and kind of break things down at a level that people can understand, no matter if, you know, coming from back into someone who started when I was very young, you know, I have a lot of readers who are very young, um, but also readers of all ages, but, but, and people of all kind of levels of interest in politics. My hope is, try to kind of bring people into the process who might not know as much about politics. So I'm always kind of soliciting questions, just be like, does this not make sense to you? Like I tried to explain a shutdown, but maybe that doesn't make sense to you. You know, email me, ask me your questions. That was always a feature of the newsletter from very early on. Um, it was always a goal of mine to be including reader questions, you know, listening to feedback, being very transparent about corrections and things like that. So um, from very early on, that was definitely a feature of it. Did you ever get any like angry 
um, partisan replies who are like yelling at this 12 year old? I, I mean, I certainly do now. I don't know how early. I, I think pretty early on, too, that that was something that would happen. I think, you know, I, people, I don't think, you know, when, when you read it, it's not like I'm talking about my age every day. So I think people don't always think of that. And I think that you see something that maybe you don't agree with from whatever side or the other. Um, I think for very long people doing that. I, there was a moment. I think during the 2016 campaign that was early and that also got some kind of media coverage when I guess I was probably like 14 or 15. And um, I think I tweeted something about Trump that went kind of like semi-viral and there was like all these Trump supporters kind of responding. I think some, I don't know about death threats, but like threats of violence, you know, things that, you know, pretty as happened to many journalists during that election cycle and since. Um, so far from an original story. But um, that was certainly a moment um, I very early on that like you, I kind of saw um, – that kind of vitriol that that would be leveled against people and and i and i think even from that age um i like to think at least i took it pretty well and i think it was you know not you know something that uh, i mean it was sad for for kind of our country that that was kind of the type of language that was being hurled but um i think from a pretty early age i developed a kind of thick skin which you need to do if you're kind of putting yourself out there um in, in this media climate obviously and was it daily from the beginning yeah every weekday morning and so how was that like you're like this teenage kid you're going to school every day, you're doing homework, you're presumably hanging out with friends or playing sports and stuff like that. Like how difficult was it to put it together every day? I, I think, you know, it's kind of ebbed and flowed in terms of how difficult it's been um, now having done it like, you know, around 12 years or something like that, um, or a little bit more than 12 years. Um, so yeah, I think at different points, it's been hard, harder, easier. I think always definitely I've been very intentional about, you know, it's not something that I kind of let dominate my life. I still, you know, now in college lead, lead I think a pretty normal college student's life and same in high school and middle school and all the rest. Um, you know, I think in, in high school, especially, um, I, I pretty much, I woke up very early. I, I would wake up at 5 55 AM is when my alarm would go off. Um, and kind of, that's when I would write it. And so I think for me, that was kind of how I was able to balance everything by just not sleeping much, which I think everyone needs a different amount of sleep. I think I just kind of decided that I didn't need that much um, and started just waking up very early. And kind of in those kind of few hours in the morning before I go to school, that's when I'd work on it. And I think, you know, at least at that point in my life, I, I kind of would try for the rest of the day. You know, it wasn't something I really would think about or work on. I was a pretty normal kid. Um, and then kind of those few hours in the morning from, you know, 6 a.m. to before I went to school, that was kind of the, the, the time I did it. So that was kind of how I juggled and compartmentalized. I kind of, you know, during school or after school, that was for other things. But then that kind of before school period was when I'd work on the newsletter. So how did it go from a email that you sent out from your Gmail account to an actual ESP with a sign up form and, you know, something that could actually grow in a more traditional way? Yeah, so I think it was in 2013, I believe that um, I joined MailChimp, um, which I used MailChimp for um, almost 10 years up until just um, last year. Now I'm on Ghost. But, um, but yeah, so eventually I joined MailChimp. I had a website through Wix. I think that was all in 2013 about. Um, and, um, and yeah, and it just kind of, I don't think changed much in terms of the format or anything, but you know, it was now, I think definitely looked a little bit more professional. Um, wasn't just coming from a Gmail account. It was actually, um, you know, I put a little more attention to kind of the styling and format. And, and yeah, and then for the first time, there was kind of this um, obviously sign up form where anyone could join. Um, I think still for the most part, a lot of the, it kind of grew very slowly kind of through word of mouth as a big part. And then also I think kind of consistently, you know, um, through, through different, you know, um, I, I was lucky to get coverage in, in different media outlets that I think kind of found it to be an interesting story. And I think especially as I get older, found it to be work, um, not just like, oh, this kid's doing this, but actually like, I, I hope at least, you know, something that was contributing something and, you know, was something at, at, at a serious enough level that, um, you know, eventually outlets like the New York Times, Washington Post, New Yorker, um, started covering it. And, and those are obviously huge sources of growth. And um, I was on CNN, NPR, kind of those kind of more major news outlets. Um, and, and those are big moments of growth where um, they would plug the website and then people go on the on, on the site and, and sign up. Yeah. So it was kind of like a novelty factor of like, here's this young kid. He's kind of precocious. He's doing something that most kids don't do. So we're going to give him media coverage. And that way, every, t every round of media coverage probably led to a big boost in signups. Yeah, I, I think that was definitely definitely a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So you then uh, you then went to college. What year did you start college? Twenty twenty. <laughs> not not a great year yeah. to start college. And you go to what G GW or Georgetown? Georgetown. Yeah. Georgetown. What's your major? I major in government. Uh huh. And so, how did that dynamic change? Like, obviously, you were a political junkie already, so it's not like you were a novice to it. You understood it. Did the college dynamic? Did that? 
change your viewpoint or your understanding of policy or did it transform the newsletter at all? Um, I think you know, definitely the big difference is, you know, I, I'm here in DC and, and that was kind of always the dream of mine that, that I, I would go to DC eventually. Um, I was lucky enough to do it, um, you know, in college. Um, and so I think, you know, I was very proud of the work that I did, you know, f- in St. Louis and, you know, it was very lucky, you know, to be able to cover um, a lot of different, you know, national politicians when they came and even interview some and also do a little bit of traveling, you know, to Iowa for the caucuses in 2016 and 2020, um, you know, and kind of do some on the ground coverage from from St. Louis. But but that kind of really, you know, changed a lot now that I've been in college. It was kind of rocky at the beginning since I started college. The um, first year was the pandemic. Georgia didn't bring students um, to DC that whole first year. Um, so that kind of complicated things. But but by now, um, I, I've been able to do a lot of kind of in-person coverage. And, um, you know, this summer alone, I, I was working on the newsletter full time this summer, was able to do coverage from the White House, Capitol and Supreme Court inside the buildings, kind of bringing my readers inside those institutions, um, you know, interviewing, you know, pretty high level officials, talking through you know, pretty important stories from where they were going on. From Camp David, too, I was able to report on this su- report from this summer, um, which is a pretty cool experience. So I think just, you know, being able to be here and have a lot more access um, to these institutions, not just, you know, cover a vote um, from afar, but actually be there, actually, you know, interviewing the lawmakers as they're going in or out, being at the White House press briefings, things like that. Um, you know, that it's still not, you know, every day, I wouldn't say, you know, there was that something like that, because I still do attend classes and I'm taking a full course load um for for now and I, i'm a senior so that'll that'll change soon but for now but but still you know trying to intersperse as much as i can um some of the on ground on the ground coverage that being in dc allows me to give have your have your classmates said anything to you or reacted to you running this newsletter or they just don't care <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know, it's a mix i mean a lot of my friends are subscribed for sure whether they read it um you'd have to ask them um i, I could check i guess but i try not to so um you know i think it ranges I definitely a lot of them know about it um and you know I, certainly, I think you know people ask me questions about politics a lot. I mean, Georgetown, as you can imagine, a school. There's a. I, I'm not the only you know student with an interest in politics. So definitely, you know, I'll, you know, have a lot of great conversations about politics with my friends. Definitely something they ask me about. I think people find it pretty cool when I'm able to go to kind of you know you know cover the Supreme Court or cover Camp David things like that. Um, but um, but but yeah. So I'd it, say it's a topic of conversation, but not like the only thing. Have you ever been about. at like a random party and discussing it, or just talking with somebody, and they'd be like them making the connection in the head that you wrote a newsletter that they read already. It, it's happened. It's yeah, happened so before. It's, it's happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of the readership, like obviously a lot of DC newsletters are kind of insider newsletters like playbook and punchable news, but like, that's not your readership, right? Like you probably do have some DC people who read it, but I'm guessing a, a huge portion of your readership is outside DC. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, I, I do have a, you know, fair size readership here in DC, but it's not my target audience, not the audience I think of when I'm writing the newsletter. I, you know, really, I mean, I started the newsletter, you know, like I said, with my mom as my first subscriber, you know, she lives in St. Louis. Um, she works at a shoe company, you know, I mean, she, she follows politics, but it's certainly not, you know, something she works and it's not something that she thinks about all day. And, you know, I think, you know, she reads the news, but not like, you know, the New York Times and Politico and the Washington Post and Axios and Punchbowl, you know, on and on and on. So that's the kind of reader that I think about. Um, and that I kind of write the newsletter for someone who wants to know about politics, who you know knows politics is important and wants to be engaged in it, but just does not have the time to be reading you know eighteen different sources and be up to date on every single cloture motion or whatever it is. So you know, there's a lot of people um, who write me say it's kind of the one thing they read about politics in the day. Like that's kind of big audience. There's a lot of students who read the newsletter, a lot of teachers who kind of read it with their classrooms and kind of have their students sign up and even sometimes like quiz their students on the newsletter. Um, or, you know, have it, build it into their curriculum in some way. That's something I hear about a lot. Um, it's definitely a lot of classrooms, definitely a lot of people of all ages just, you know, interested to get a little more involved. But then there are also, you know, something that I've found is kind of, you know, with the kind of formula of writing about, writing about Washington not for Washington, you know, and kind of including some of these kind of explanatory details that I think get left out of, you know, a punch bowl or a playbook, you know, just kind of talking very clearly, okay, what is a government shutdown? What does that mean? What is the appropriations process? How does it work? Um, I think you'd be surprised how many people here in DC too kind of appreciate those refreshers. Um, so I also hear from you know congressional staffers who use the newsletter um, to help write their daily briefings for their bosses. People at the White House, you know, even members of Congress, you know, administration officials, pretty top journalists and media executives. Um, there's kind of people at all levels who who do read the newsletter because I think even by kind of focusing 
on the kind of just level of, of explaining things, that's something that a lot of people find helpful. Maybe even if it's not for them, but also for how they are kind of communicating information to their you know clients, if you're a lobbyist or something, or to their boss, if you're a staffer. Um, so I think it's a formula that's worked for kind of a wider audience than you might think, but certainly kind of people inside the Beltway are not my target, um, which I do think differentiates me from a lot of the other DC newsletters. And you mentioned that you're starting to incorporate like more original reporting into, into it. How did that come about? Did you, and like, how did you learn those reporting skills? Was it just completely self-taught? Did you take any journalism classes? Like what, what was the process of, of, you know, becoming or focusing more on original reporting? Yeah, I mean, I've now taken some journalism classes. I'm a journalism minor. Georgetown doesn't have a major, but I'm a minor um, in the program here at Georgetown. And I've been very fortunate. You know, Georgetown has a lot of really top flight um, journalists who are kind of adjunct professors that I've been able to take classes from. And so that's definitely helped. But um, but but even kind of in high school, yeah, I think is when I kind of first started to perfect or, or not perfect, but, you know, kind of try to, to get better and better um, at that. And, you know, I, I had a lot of, you know, kind of, I think, interesting experiences um, even when I was covering politics in St. Louis, you know, I, um, Jill Stein came to St. Louis for an event and I was able to interview her in like this closet, um, actually with Eugene Daniels, who's now the co-author of Playbook, but was then a reporter at Newsy. And we were the two reporters there at that event. And suddenly there we were interviewing her. Um, and that was definitely a kind of lesson and kind of on the spot generating questions and coming up with things to ask about. Um, I covered, like I said, a few primary debates, even at that age, um, was in the spin room, you know, with all the other reporters yelling out questions at at politicians. Um, so being able to be there and see the other journalists and how they were doing it, but then, and then also doing it myself, um, those were definitely educations. Um, and, and I cover you know, pretty much any time a national politician would come to St. Louis, um, whether it was Trump, Obama, Biden, both Clintons, you know, you name it. Um, I, I, I made sure to get credentials and cover it. And, and, I, and I got to know pretty well, actually, a lot of the journalists kind of in the St. Louis kind of political press corps at the Post-Dispatch at St. Louis Public Radio. Um, and would watch them kind of go up to voters at these events, interview them. And I think that was really kind of my education was how I kind of learned and kind of watching those other kind of journalists and then start doing it myself. And those skills I've been able to apply and definitely kind of expand on, you know, now that I'm here in Washington. But you're not really focusing on like scoop oriented journalism. You're just like interviewing people to like help explain things better or something like that. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I have a lot of respect for, for journalists who do that. I, I think my, my goal and my readers, I don't think, you know, it's not, you know, who's the first to report on, you know, who's voting this way or kind of these kind of very granular parts of the process, which are important. And I think that work, you know, has a place, but yeah, but that's not my goal. And so, yeah, so I think a, a lot more kind of interviews where exactly if there's someone who I think has an interesting kind of point of view or they can kind of tell kind of an interesting story about politics or what's going on or kind of, you know, help people, like you say, understand um, a certain aspect of political process that I think is important to know. That's kind of a lot more where that reporting comes in or, you know, in cases where I'm, you know, covering something, you know, this summer, I reported from inside the Supreme Court the day the affirmative action decisions were handed down. Um, and kind of the, a big thrust of the piece was just like, this is what it's like inside the Supreme Court when they're announcing an important decision. Actually, you know, you'd be interested to know, like, they they give summaries of their opinions, but very say very different things than what are actually written in the written decisions. Um, and um, but the, but they're not. It's not videoed. It's not televised at all. So you know, I was one of I think eleven reporters in that room who got to hear it. Um, and kind of was able to bring that to my readers, be like, this is what it's like, you know, in, in those rooms, in those kind of halls of power, um, and, and kind of just give that view, no matter what the issue is or what's kind of being discussed that day. I think that's something a lot of people find valuable because I think the vast majority of my readers will never find themselves, you know, in the Senate press gallery watching a vote or in the Supreme Court as opinions are being announced. And I think people are always really fascinated to hear, you know, this is what these rooms are like. These are what the people are saying kind of, you know, when the cameras are off. Hey, I just want to interrupt the programming for just a moment to note that you are at the halfway point of the video. If you made it this far, then that's probably a sign that you like this sort of content. So maybe just take a second to subscribe to the channel below. If you're feeling especially generous, you can hit the like button. Okay, back to the show. And um, obviously there are already always tons of special interests within DC. We're trying to lobby people or lobby reporters to write about certain things. Do you get any of that where, you know, some kind of trade association or lobbyist or someone from, you know, political candidate or something is trying to put, push you into covering some issue or something like that? I definitely get it. Um, I, yeah, I see that all the time, you know, a, a lot of campaigns for sure, like pitching their candidates as, you know, maybe want to interview so-and-so or, or yeah, interest groups. I, almost always, it's not something I end up pursuing just because I'm pretty limited in my focus in terms of just kind of wanting to get my readers caught up on what's going on in Washington today. You know, what happened yesterday, what's going to happen the day ahead. That's kind of my focus. 
Um, and I don't really stray from that that much. And, you know, I think I, I don't, there's a lot of stuff that, that I don't cover and that I just don't, if I don't think it's kind of the most important things that my readers need to know to stay informed about politics. So I do get pitches like that a lot. I'd say it's pretty rare that I'll actually kind of jump on one um, if it seems like kind of more like a side thing and not um, kind of the, what I think is kind of an important issue or campaign or contest for, for my readers to know about. Also, it's, this isn't your full-time job yet, so you, you only have limited time to put together. The exactly. Day. That what, is true. What's your interactions with like the Washington press corps been like, like, have they accepted you as one of their own? Do they, do you, are you friends with any of them? Like what's that been like? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think there's definitely, I feel like some, a stereotype of journalists is kind of very you know competitive and territorial and not always like, the most generous or kind of willing to share. That has not been my experience. I feel like you, when I since when I was very young, whenever I'd be at kind of events um, and covering different you know debates or rallies or whatever, you know, I always found journalists to be very happy to kind of help and point me in the right direction and kind of give advice. And, and that remains true today. And yeah, I think there are definitely a lot of journalists on um, my kind of top publications that I, I consider friends and mentors and people that always have kind of steered me the right way. And um, I think yeah, for the most part, do accept me as kind of one of the rest of the journalists. I mean, at this point. Most of the time when I'm going to the White House or the Capitol, most of the other reporters um, will know who I am or they'll be like, are you the kid who does make it politics? And they'll kind of recognize it like, oh, I've been reading you for years. And like, you know, that's something that happens a lot um, at this point, interactions with other journalists when I go cover things. So for at the most part, I think Twitter has been a big part of that, how I think I was able to kind of get on the radar of a lot of other journalists. Um, so I think most of them are kind of pretty familiar and, and are, have always been you know very happy to help and, um, and, and pretty generous with their time. What about like the editors or executives at media companies? Have they tried to get you on board to do something for them at all versus like well, just staying independent? A little bit. I mean, I've certainly, I, people reach out and, you know, and I, I've certainly had meetings with, you know, people fr- from different kind of publications. I wouldn't say necessarily like trying, trying to hire me or recruit, but definitely like just kind of keeping conversations open. You know, I, you know, I hear from people a lot, you know, I think people know what I'm doing and kind of interested to see what. I'll be doing next. So definitely hear from people. I've done a little bit of freelance writing um, as well. So that's something that, you know, comes together every once in a while. Someone will reach out and um, that's happened. So I would say, you know, I I, I think that there's, there are a lot of media executives that read the newsletter. Um, and I think most of those conversations have started from like, hey, I like what you're doing. Like there's something I found helpful, which I always find crazy because like these are people running these big news organizations and they're going to my newsletter. It's, it's something I find very humbling um, and, and frankly surprising every time I hear it. Um, and that's usually how those conversations start. And, and, you know, and I think certainly in the next few months, I'm going to be thinking a lot more about what I'll be doing next. So it's definitely interesting to, to hear from different people and hear what situations are like at different news outlets. And has the growth of the newsletter accelerated in recent years? I would say if, I feel like it ebbs and flows, as I think is the case with a lot of, you know, political news sites kind of with the um, with what's going on. So I think you definitely see big accelerations during election periods, you know, kind of less so during other times. I, you know, I think, you know, at this point in the middle, this is around 40,000, which is level, you know, I'm pretty happy with, you know, obviously I'm still in college. I think, frankly, you know, sometimes I feel like, you know, again, because I said, you know, getting questions and feedback from readers, something such a big part of it. I, I get even just now a lot more emails that I can handle from people and kind of more emails than I can respond to. And I try to respond to most of them, but it can get very hard. So I feel like it's kind of a level I'm very comfortable with. And I'm very proud that my open rate is never below 50%. Um, and so that's something I'm really proud of that. And, and, and frankly, something I pay a little bit more attention to than the subscribers is just that I that the audience that is there is, is pretty engaged um, and, and is reading it and clicking the links and stuff like that. Um, and, and the mailing list, it kind of ebbs and flows. And you see, you know, a, some the day there'll be a big vote or a big election. You see a lot of people forwarding it, kind of a lot of shares on Twitter or whatever, and then a lot of new subscribers. Other days, not as much. Um, I, I would say it, it kind of ebbs and flows. And how have you monetized it so far? Yeah, so the newsletter is completely free. Um, so no one needs to pay and there's no advertising, um, but there is an option to donate and, and people you know can do that if they want, if they kind of appreciate the work I'm doing. Um, and and I've, I've been very gratified by the number of people that, that have, um, have donated and also you know um, several hundred of people who have set up recurring donations and kind of give on a monthly basis, um, kind of akin to a subscription for another news outlet. Um, at this moment, um, they don't get anything in return for doing that. It's just they're supporting the newsletter and kind of the knowledge that as long as there's kind of enough people doing that, I'm able to keep it free because, you know, it's, um, you know, able to kind of, um, you know, live on its own is kind of something that I'm doing. Um, so that, that's been really great that for me, you know, I, I've been very happy that I've been able to keep it free, but also that enough people have kind of um, appreciated enough that, that they're 
um, kind of donating to support it. And that, that's my hope to keep it that way with, with the caveat that, that I also hope to kind of expand to give something to kind of people who are, who are giving, especially people giving on a monthly basis, kind of expanding those you new know, kind of perks that they're getting. But for right now, it's just people um, who just do it because they like the work and want to see it keep going and um, want to support me as I'm in college and um, been very gratified by the number of people that have done that. And like your, your decision not to have advertising, is that some kind of conscious choice or is it just from lack of, you know, the time and the ability to go out and sell advertising? I mean, partly, I think probably lack, lack of time and ability, but, but mostly, I mean, it is something, even after I'm out of college, when I would have more time, it's something that, that I like, that, that I'd like to continue if possible. I, I will say one thing, um, I have a lot of respect for a lot of the other DC newsletters, but I hear from people all the time that one of the reasons they like Wake to Politics, not the others, is because you see those native advertising, you know, re- that really does um, push off a lot of people, at least readers that I hear from, you know, where, where you have newsletters that have advertising kind of in the exact format of the newsletter and where people um, could kind of think that it, that is content or, or when newsletters are sponsored by the exact kind of companies or trade organizations that they're covering pretty closely. Um, so, you know, that's something that's pretty endemic in newsletters and something I know a lot of my readers are uncomfortable with and something that, frankly, I think um, raises kind of ethical questions as well. Um, so I think kind of, if possible, you know, the idea of staying independent from that, not that that's the only way to offer advertising in a newsletter, obviously, but it certainly, I would say, is probably one of the biggest ones in, in kind of the other DC newsletters. It, for as long as I'm able to stay kind of free and ad-free, I think gives a level of independence that um, I think makes the newsletter more trustworthy in my readers' eyes, makes it more authentic. Um, and, and again, if if I'm able financially to do that, it's something that I would like to do kind of not just for, for the time, but also um, I think on the principle of, of it does kind of give an added layer of independence. So when uh, when did you decide to start taking donations or when did you start taking them? I really, it was not like, it wasn't a decision so much as like a need in that it was right after I was covered in the New York Times um, in uh, 2017, which is obviously a very exciting moment and kind of the biggest moment of growth for the newsletter. I went from a couple thousand to like tens of thousands of subscribers, you know, in like a day overnight and and literally what happened and other newsletter writers will be familiar with this is like i hit the limit of what you could um have mailchimp for free and so um and obviously i was you know six years or whatever so i did not have you know funds to pay out of my pocket to you know be using mailchimp so i said you know I love doing the newsletter. You know, if you like it too, you know, I just need your help because, you know, suddenly what was free in a day became, you know, frankly, pretty expensive. Um, and, you know, there's pretty high costs when you have, you know, the sort of list that suddenly kind of my list expanded to being. Um, and that was, and actually what happened, the honest truth is so that day, the next day I started doing the newsletter and I was like, yo, if I'm going to do the newsletter at the end of the month, I suddenly going to need to pay, which was the first time that was the case. Um, and so I just asked, I said, if you'll help. And I got so many donations and I was so overwhelmed by it. And I mean, I was very flattered, but you know, it was you know, way more than I really, that I needed at that age, certainly. And more than I needed to do going that I shut it off. And I, and like, after like two days, and I was like, thank you so much. Like that was enough. Like that was enough to pay the MailChimp costs for a good amount of time. So I was like, thank you. Like I asked, and you guys responded. And I was very flattered by that. And I just stopped because it was not something I was doing for the money. It was really, I was just asking to be able to support the newsletter, keep going. So that was when I started doing donations. And then um, it was really a few years later, you know, once I was in college. And, and then again, it was kind of the decision of like, I love doing the newsletter. If it's something that um, I want to keep doing at the level of commitment that I'm doing, you know, it, it has to be something like a part-time job because otherwise, you know, that time I would need to be going to, to some other job or, you know, do something else to kind of support myself. Um, and again, I've been very flattered that a lot of readers have responded um, and kind of understood as I, I've aged. Obviously, you know, needs evolve, and you know, and again, um, the primary thing is you know that make donations, make sure that it can keep going to the different costs, whether it's you know just paying for Ghost, which which also can be pretty expensive, you know, on a monthly basis, as well as for subscriptions to a whole bunch of news outlets. Um, that I subscribe to be able to do the newsletter and a lot of other costs, um, and then also to make sure that that you know I can continue to support myself, you know, as a college student, kind of doing this on the side. Um, and so, again, it's something that I've been very gratified that, that a lot of people have responded and, um, you know, I, I think see enough value in the newsletter um, to, to, to want to support it, even though they're not really getting anything in return other than the newsletter, which they could be getting for free. Um, so I'm very, very proud and very honored that, that a lot of people um, have, have given. And what would you say, like, how do you drive donations? Like, what are some of the most effective ways that you get people to, you know, stop being freeloaders and actually mm-hmm. help pay for it? Yeah, I mean, something I've started doing is pretty much every Friday, not not every Friday, but most Fridays, um, I'll, I'll include kind of an appeal and just kind of write, I'll start the newsletter, usually with some 
I'll probably usually start by writing something that's kind of on my mind that week or kind of write something that isn't necessarily news of the day, but just kind of like a little bit more just kind of what I'm thinking about or kind of a more personal note for me. And, 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 and usually that'll kind of include some sort of appeal of like, if you want to keep reading my work um, or kind of interested in what I'm doing, um, donate. Also, each Friday, I include something which, which I think is a fairly unique feature of the newsletter, um, which is just this very hyper focus each Friday on what the government is doing what the government has done this week, which sounds obviously like something that you would think um, is very universal, but I'm talking about kind of bills that are passing through committees or passing the Senate or House, often on a very bipartisan basis that almost no one is covering. Um, like just this morning I did one, I did it, you know, we're talking on a Friday, um, and, you know, including on a committee passage of the Safer Banking Act involved in marijuana banking, committee passage of a bill that, um, We'll give a lot of funding for rape kit backlogs. President Biden signing a bill, bipartisan bill that is transforming the organ transplant system. Bills like that that can have a big impact, but are not getting a lot of coverage because they're not the main news. And that's, I've learned a feature that people really love, but it's also a feature that takes a lot of time and research. So usually I'll kind of introduce and kind of give some message about um, why I think that feature is important and kind of talking about the bipartisanship and kind of across the aisle work that is happening, kind of how the gears of government are kind of turning, even in a time when it seems that things are very dysfunctional. Um, and also say, and if you appreciate my focus on that, and you think that's an important thing um, to people know about, you know, it takes a lot of time to research this, please donate. And like just last week, I kind of wrote a kind of longish appeal um, kind of based on that and kind of talking about highlighting some polling that shows how that's the kind of coverage people say, at least in polling that they're looking for. They want to hear more about that bipartisanship. They want to hear more about the issues that are actually being worked on. Um, and I kind of said, I'm trying to, you know, trying to offer that um if you appreciate it donate and like i again last week overwhelmed by by all the people that um donated new people that set up recurring donations um so that's been the main thing is just kind of sending out those appeals every once in a while and, and people responding um in numbers that that are really been, been flattered by and you know you're graduating soon the amount of revenue you have to or the amount of money you have to make as a college student versus someone who is you know, full-time employed, there's a wide gulf in that. So do you think that going forward, once you graduate, that you will be able to, you know, and assume, I mean, we'll talk about whether you want to do the, continue doing this full-time or do something else, but if you were to focus doing this full-time, do you think it would remain a donation-focused publication, advertising-free publication, or do you think you would need to start thinking more like a business at that point? You know, it's certainly my hope to kind of keep it um, you know, as much in the spirit as, as it's been as possible, you know, this past summer, I worked on it full time. And it was how I supported myself. And I, you know, I, I live here in an apartment with some other roommates, um, who, you know, other classmates of mine, um, friends, and, you know, I paid my rent, paid for my groceries, you know, paid for everything, you know, need to be doing, you know, um, just based off the news that are not, you know, kind of any other, um, not any other jobs or anything like that. Um, and that was kind of my focus over the summer. Um, and I found, Kind of went okay and i was able to do it and you know that people kind of responded and i made appeals like that so that's kind of my hope is if it's able to continue to be something that i'm able to support myself i would love to do it um i like i said i'd love to ramp up you know some you know kind of system of, of kind of perks and things that people get um when they kind of give recurring donations i you know my hope is that all the kind of like information kind of like news is kind of stays free but um but kind of giving added things that people could get kind of behind a paywall i that kind of friday feature i talked about that's something i've thought about putting behind a paywall ultimately though i kind of think it's important for people to know about and kind of my whole my hope is that i i won't do that and that'll kind of be able to keep being free and hopefully on a donation system but kind of more of like a partial paywall system for for certain kind of added things um I, from my experience so far it seems like um th that that could be kind of a model that that i'd be able to support myself and and if i can i'd love to do it so when you graduate, you'll you'll have that something that's very rare for new graduates is you'll have an already existing business that has the potential to be kind of your full time career if that's what you want out of it. Um, not a lot of kids like that was kind of my dream when I was coming up through the blogosphere and blogging in college. But back then, the monetization just I graduated in 2006 and the monetization just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had to go and become like a traditional journalist and kind of, you know, work in the traditional world for several years and didn't become self-employed until like 2014 when I was like, when I was already 30. Um, so given that there's this rare opportunity, but 
there's something to be said about mentorship, uh, sure. collegial, or you know, having colleagues, going to happy hours after work and stuff like that. Sure. Certainly things that I miss now that I've been self-employed for so long in terms of meeting new friends and stuff like that. So you have kind of all these opportunities coming out of this where you could keep on doing this, but then you also have the experience in terms of content creation, marketing, building a media business that would be very valuable to a traditional media business. So you could probably find a job, not to not have a difficult time finding a job. How, how are you thinking about this, about what you're going to do once you graduate? Yeah, I think, honestly, I feel like it, it changes week by week, you know, I, I'm, you know, and it's something I think about a lot. And I think kind of everything you just described, I kind of impulses were like, I think some days I can wake up and I'm like, wow, like I, you know, I, I feel very lucky, um, you know, partially like you said, based on the time that I grew up and just because of, in some cases, random opportunities that have come my way and random kind of media coverage that's come my way, you know, um, I, I think, you know, partially by, by working for it, but also, you know, everything is a little bit of luck. Um, that, that I can kind of graduate college and, you know, have a mailing list of 40,000 readers, many of whom are very engaged and kind of loyal and, um, and able to kind of cover the stories I want to cover and kind of work for myself and kind of, you know, be, be my own boss. That, that's something that's very appealing, but also, you know, everything you talked about, you know, I, you know, I think certainly, you know, could benefit from being in kind of a more traditional structure and kind of getting the mentorship and kind of collegiality, everything you said. Um, is obviously something I could benefit from. I think kind of my dream scenario would be if it's possible to kind of do something, you know, that's somewhere in the middle. And that's something I've talked about with, you know, some of the kind of publications we were talking about of people that have reached out to me of like, if there's a way that I could continue keeping the newsletter, kind of do it um, for as long as possible and kind of independent as possible, but also maybe kind of parlay, you know, my, my skills and kind of what I've learned and, and my abilities that I think I've kind of developed um, in terms of kind of explaining politics to general audience as well as you know, the audience that I've kind of built to kind of work with another news outlet in some capacity where able to kind of do both and kind of carry the newsletter and do something else. When I was in high school, my senior year of high school and freshman year of college, I did a podcast with St. Louis Public Radio, the NPR affiliate in St. Louis, which was called the Wake Up Politics Podcast, um, but was very different than the daily newsletter. Um, it was also kind of a goal of explaining politics, but, um, but with kind of a different format and, you know, involving interviews and kind of, you know, kind of more kind of bigger picture stuff that was a really exciting partnership and kind of gave me the ability to continue doing the newsletter but also kind of work within a newsroom structure and kind of learn a lot from the journalists of St. Louis Public Radio um learned a lot about podcasting learned a lot about kind of what makes a good story um that was really exciting for me and and was really fun to be able to work with them I had to put that on hold frankly just because we in college it got to be a lot and I wanted to have time to kind of just be in college so that kind of got to be a lot but I think something like that um, going forward would really be kind of my dream where I'm able to kind of do the newsletter, but also if there's some news outlet that kind of thought that, you know, I might be able to bring something to them and my audience, you know, might be able to bring an audience to them was able to kind of partner with some, some project, newsletter, podcast, whatever it might be, um, where I could kind of both kind of benefit from, from, from learning from another news outlet, but then also be able to carry on, you know, obviously a project that I really love doing and um, that I hope a lot of people are getting value out of. Um, and to kind of be able to do a little bit of both, whether that's possible, maybe not, we'll see. And yeah, you know, I, I never close the door to anything. If, you know, if I felt like circumstances demanded that I, you know, stop doing politics, either because the opportunity comes along that I really love or because, you know, financially it just doesn't make sense anymore. You know, I, I would, I'm not, you know, committing myself to doing it forever, but it is something I really love and the independence of it. I really love. So if I'm able to kind of find an arrangement where a little bit of both would happen, you know, that would be my dream. Maybe that isn't possible, but that would kind of be. The dream to me yeah like the, the the example of the podcast is a good example of what i see in the marketplace like you think like matt iglesias who has mm -hmm. his own independent newsletter but he was still podcasting for vox and then later grid mm -hmm. news or like a steve hayes from the dispatch who's like a court or a um contributor to like cnn or nbc i forget which one mm -hmm. so, some, something where you're doing something for a traditional media company and there's exactly. like a there's uh, it's kind of like a mutually beneficial thing that not exactly. only are they paying you to do this, but then it's also helping you drive more attention to your newsletter, stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. Casey Newton, you know, he, yeah. he is right, so the the, the, our New York the times, times podcast yeah. For yeah. With, yeah. yeah, exactly with the times. Um, and I think you know, that's an example of the times recognizing, you know, Substack audiences are something they want to reach into. Um, so you wouldn't think necessarily that a, you know, one man news, or I think it's actually two people or however many people could be a benefit to kind of the paper of record, but increasingly in kind of the ecosystem we are, that is. And so I think that is something you see more and more as kind of outlets like that partnering, even yeah, with people at Substack or kind of with kind of smaller newsletters because they see it as a two way beneficial relationship. Okay, Gabe. Well, those are all the questions I have for you. Where can people find you online? 
yeah, the, you can subscribe to the newsletter at wakeuptopolitics.com. You can also find me on Twitter at wake up to politics with the number two. Awesome. Well, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Big fan of your, of your newsletter and podcast.